We'll now move to the session. Um, and the first one, Improving Malaria Governance. Our facilitator is Professor Marcia Castro, my colleague at Harvard. Marcia, over to you. Thanks, Diane. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's my great honor and pleasure um, to serve as facilitator of this session. So our first session today uh, follows up uh, discussions we started yesterday. So this session is still about governance and we are gonna focus on two different things. So first, um, we're gonna talk about financing uh, programs for malaria elimination. So the challenges, but also the opportunities and the game changers as uh, Professor Rosie just mentioned. And the second one, uh, we're gonna learn from previous programs um, of elimination and considering different aspects of, of governance. So uh, to do this discussion, we put together a really stellar uh, set of speakers and discussants. So our first speaker will be Dr. Ravi Ranan Ilya. Um, he's the executive director of the Institute for Health Policy in Sri Lanka. He's a public health physician and economist who has worked extensively on the challenges of health systems, financing and equity, non-communicable diseases, aging and quality of care. So Dr. Ravi, we're gonna start with you uh, talking about malaria financing. Uh, morning, uh, afternoon or evening to everyone. Um, I'm very excited to join you um, and thank you, uh, Professor Masia, for, for introducing me. Um, I haven't been to Boston for a long time, but I was long, for a long time a, a student in, in your department, so probably before your time. So very excited to be here today uh, and join the discussion. So let me um, get on with, with uh, my thoughts on financing and the papers on, online that has already been mentioned. Um, I have to say, when Michael Reich asked me, um, I think earlier this year, to join this effort, I was a bit surprised because I don't think of myself as a malaria expert. I'm not a malaria expert. I'm basically somebody who works in health systems, health financing, uh, and broader equity issues, and not specifically in malaria. And as it turns out, in my own country, we have no malaria. I'm from Sri Lanka. We eliminated malaria several years ago. So probably not I thought not necessarily the best person, but I think what I realized uh, in this whole effort was like maybe I brought a different uh, perspective on thinking about some of these problems. And the other thing is that I'm coming from Sri Lanka. I'm not a historian like my colleague Jesse Bump, but I am, I guess, a student of history. And uh, I there are certain aspects of Sri Lanka's history in combating malaria over a hundred years or so, which I think is highly relevant today to what other countries do, particularly in Africa. So that's what I. I'm going to try and bring into this discussion. So let me start with what the problem is. The, the, the fundamental problem in this initiative is, I think, a desire to figure out what to do with this stagnation in malaria improvement and, and the apparent roadblock to achieving elimination globally. And this is associated, and I think this is part of the angst, with this um, plateauing stagnation in international financing. And this is some figures from WHO. It shows you the trend in international financing from governments, from big funders such as the Global Fund and then the Bill and Gates, Bill and Gates Foundation, et cetera. As you can see, um, there was a huge increase from in the last decade, previous decade, but in this decade, there's such a big stagnation. Now, I think there's a lot of concern that this is a failure. We haven't been able to increase financing. I think my, my view on this would be, no, it is really more a success than failure. The malaria community has was very successful and exceptionally successful in mobilizing funding by persuading a number of key funders 20 years ago to put substantial amounts of money into new financing architectures to pay for malaria elimination. So you have the Gay Foundation, the Fund, PMI, et cetera. So all of these were successes. Those funding channels have remained even though political interest in malaria shifted away. So I think this is a success, but we do have this stagnation. I think what people are worried about, and I think they're asking, and they asked me is, you know, what's the prospects for increasing financing? And I have to say, I have to be very realistic. I, I'm very skeptical there is substantial new funding going to appear uh, in the malaria scene. I know people are very excited by COVID-19. I mean, uh, they can see the large amounts of money that have, that have been put into COVID-19 and into the response, but I don't think that provides a necessary uh, transferable lesson. The mobilization of finance of COVID-19, which was literally in the trillions of dollars, is simply not comparable. And for several reasons. One is malaria is not 
a comparable imminent threat to the global economy. And it's not a threat to high income economies. And so we're not, it should be realistic, we're not going to expect high income economies to plow vast amounts of money into malaria control. And let's not forget, you know, a few months ago, the G7 couldn't even find the political willingness or political will to find any real money for COVID vaccines for Africa or for the rest of the world. And that's, that's the reality. So in that context, trying to find money for malaria is going to be very hard. The other point to make is that because of COVID, it's had a huge economic impact. Most rich countries have spent heavily. They've increased their public debt, sometimes to over 100% of GDP. They're going to spend the next few years raising taxes, constraining spending. This is not the kind of climate you'll have to, to find additional increases in ODA. So that's the reality. So I think business as usual isn't going to, isn't going to work. Um, but one thing I should mention um, in terms of some fairly pessimistic about increased funding, but there's one potential silver lining in this, and that's the, the emergence of uh, China as a potential large ODA funder. Um, but there are some issues with that. First of all, China has some advantages in this. It does have a very recent experience of successful malaria elimination. I think that's very relevant. And it has a strong interest in supporting economic growth in Africa, much of the malaria burden is, and it is very interested in sharing malaria expertise. But there are some downsides. The first is that its ODA ecosystem is very, very limited. It has very limited capacity to engage with the, I think, global malaria community in many ways. And the other problem is it has very limited voice in the global financing architecture such as the Global Fund, but also other entities. And I think that's a problem because the global financing of architecture for now is dominated by existing established powers. And many of them, I think, let's be honest, are very reluctant to cede influence, especially to China. And you, know, you can read the editorials and newspaper articles about those issues in the past week even to, to see that. So I think that it's, it's potential opportunity there, but I think realistically, very limited prospects for increased financing international. So we have to do more with less or we have to do more with existing funding. So that's what I want to talk about. In terms of international financing, you know, we could think about, well, could we use it more efficiently, more effectively? And that gets into a number of issues related to the problems. And these are very well known. I, I don't, you know, I'm not the first person to talk about these issues or write about them. Uh, the problems with international financing, how it affects malaria control at the country level. We can think about the multiplicity of funders in many countries, the, the transaction costs this creates, et cetera, the problems that program managers have when they have to answer to external funders, their own government, their own communities. These are real problems. And these, I think, you know, what it does is it raises the transaction costs. It makes international financing less efficient, but it's not necessarily making the international financing a bad thing. It just makes it just inefficient. The second problem with international financing is I think the issue of accountability and influence. I think there's clearly insufficient weight for WHO, but I think here, and I think a lot of people in WHO probably want more money to be given to them, more money in global fund to transfer to them or from MI. We have to be realistic. Funders give money, but they expect control and influence. It's not realistic to expect that money to go to WHO to other places. Third, I think they, these funders potentially have a negative influence on what the malaria strategy is. And here I want to talk about that next slide. So here's and here's a very beautiful example of this. This is, you know, the annual report from the pres uh, PMI, uh, President's Malaria Initiative, to the U.S. Congress, essentially to the U.S. electorate on, and the U.S. politicians on what they did with American taxpayers' money. Sorry, and Rafi, one minute. Sure, sure. One minute. The key thing Thank to you. notice that this is really all about commodities. And what it doesn't talk about is management capacity, and that everyone agrees the Malaria Committee is a key constraint. Next and why is that? Because it's not sexy enough for the voters, it's not sexy enough for the politics. It's really a question of accountability. So international funding is useful, but it comes at cost. So what can be done? I think we have to think about domestic financing. And here I'll point out what's often overlooked is that countries themselves spend, themselves spend far more than international funders. And this is just a comparison of the Nigerian spending compared to all the international funding. Here I would just take one couple of lessons from the historical experience of Sri Lanka and China, these countries had effective health systems with very high levels of access to healthcare, and they had strategies which focused on treatment. And treatment is clearly very important. And why is this not happening in Africa? You know, there's a large gap between what African people want, voters want. They want better access to healthcare. They want free healthcare. They're not so much interested in the malaria programs, but if you want to improve malaria programs, you have to strengthen the healthcare systems. And we have to figure out why is it that the African governments 
respond, don't respond to voters in meeting their needs, but are responding more to the concerns of the malaria funders. Next. So I'll just end with my final takeaway here. So I think then my kind of concluding thought in this paper was that if we want to build access to malaria services, community confidence in malaria services, build local management capacity, build local ownership, that's inseparable from a commitment to universal access. And the problem here is not lack of finance. There is funding available in countries, but the problem is we have to make the policies and the systems accountable to voters in those countries, not voters in the countries, because they're not the ones living with malaria. It's the voters and people in Africa or in other countries who are living. They're the ones who should be driving policy and overall health systems. And that's also the experience of Sri Lanka. And one thing I will say about decolonization, Sri Lanka, in a sense, decolonized in the 1930s because we started to elect our own governments for all sorts of odd reasons. And I think the lesson from Sri Lanka is that's fundamentally the most important lesson. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. Um, you bring about important points, and I'm glad you mentioned universal healthcare system. That's one of the most important targets of the SDG3 for health. It's the backbone for all the others, I guess. Okay, so our second speaker um, is uh, Dr. Kalechi Ohiri. Um, he's the chief executive officer of the HSDF, a healthcare advisory firm, and visiting scientist at Harvard University. He's the founder of the Healthcare Leadership Academy and previously served as the special advisor to the Minister of Finance, as well as two ministers of health in Nigeria. His focus is on social protection and strengthening health systems. Kalechi. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to um, share um, our paper. And um, this was a collaborative effort with two of my colleagues, um, doctors, and for me, uh, King so I'll be presenting on their behalf. Um, a lot has been said about the, the rationale for this particular work and um, about the reduction or the stagnation in the gains that have been made um, in malaria control over the years. And secondly, the fact that the COVID pandemic provided an opportunity in, in two ways. Um, first is the fact that um, it's resulted in a reduction or a diversion in focus and resources from uh, other diseases, including malaria programs, and therefore re-emphasizing the need for resilient health systems. But more importantly as well, is that it threw up a lot of questions and forced us to begin to rethink if there are lessons and insights from the way the world has responded to COVID that we could learn and apply. And this is not just limited to COVID-19, um, but also um, that sparked a, a reflection of other successful disease control programs and to see if there are actually any lessons that we could learn from them as we are at an inflection point where we're actually rethinking the way um, malaria um, programs are governed globally. So against this background, I mean, we essentially sought to identify what the governance, cha governance challenges were. So key questions were really around describing what the main governance challenges were and seeing if we could learn anything from successful disease eradication programs and if these lessons were applicable to malaria. So we reviewed literature and interviewed several um, stakeholders who ran and managed some of these programs as well as malaria programs created a conceptual framework and tested these with the advisory um, committee. We ended up with roughly eight governance themes, right? Um, that we felt we distilled from some of these programs that were levers that could be pulled to actually rethink the way malaria was governed. And these were like international coordination and support, um, financing, I'm not gonna go into detail because I think Ravi has covered that in detail multi-sectoral collaboration, the role of technology and innovation, particularly its availability and diffusion in poor countries. The use of data, we touched on that yesterday, and um, we can go into that a bit more today. Um, issues around country ownership and agency, um, the way the national programs are structured, and a lot of discussion yesterday on community engagement um, is also very relevant to what we're um, discussing. And then we examined these themes across four global disease programs. Um, first, we picked um, the Global Smallpox Eradication Program, one of the great public health success stories. Um, secondly, the Global Polio Eradication um, 
pro, um, efforts um, with a focus on Latin America and some reference to um, what happened in Nigeria, <clears throat> um, my country of origin. And third, we looked at the Uncle Sekaiasis eradication programs. And then lastly, COVID-19, not because we've successfully eradicated COVID-19, we're still grappling with it, but there are critical lessons that you know, we could actually learn from and apply. I'll not go into a lot of uh, the themes, but I'll just pick out about three or four of them. And um, the first is on the whole question about international support and coordination. What we found was that some of these successful programs had behind them, or I'll say in front of them, a global champion. In the case of the UNCO program, it was Robert McNamara in 1972 when he visited Burkina Faso. And um, he made that his legacy and committed World Bank's resources um, to that program, of course, joined by others like the Carter Foundation, um, et cetera. And for polio, um, the former US president, um, FDR, um, Roosevelt, I think because he was also affected for it, uh, uh, by it, began to commit resources through the March of Dimes and other initiatives. And there are examples of other people who have stood behind global programs. And I guess the question for malaria is, um, who would be that global champion who would stake their legacy on the eradication of malaria? Do we need that person? And would that person be useful in accelerating our efforts towards eradication? Second thing I'll touch on is multi-sectoral collaboration. Now, this is critical. And, um, and we've seen that play out in many disease, in many disease programs um, with the private sector, the pharma industry, working together um, with those in the environment sector, et cetera, to eradicate programs. Now, we, we've seen that as well in COVID, right? Where most, most national responses for COVID-19 involve all the sectors that are affected sitting around the table. Is malaria still um, viewed primarily as a health problem? I guess if we look at those who are on this call, um, I would say we're probably you know, disproportionately represented in the, in the health sector. And why are, where are the environmentalists um, in the room? Where are the finance and economists in the room? And the question is when COVID-19 um, started, it was very easy to convene um, other sectors because the narrative about why this was not just a health sector problem was very clear. And so the role of the Ministry of Trade, Transport, Finance, everybody was very clear. And a lot of conversations about malaria eradication um, tends to be very health sector focused. Is there something to learn here? Um, thirdly, the role of technology and innovation. And um, we saw that with um, smallpox, with innovations like the bifurcated needle, freeze-dried vaccines, et cetera, in accelerating progress. Um, we do have promising new vaccines in malaria, et cetera, but I think this underscores the need for investing a lot more in research, investing a lot more in technologies and innovations that would be the game changers um, in malaria eradication. And then lastly, I'll just touch on, on the use of data. Um, and I think what we saw was the, the importance of the availability of real time, high quality data that was frequently provided and guided decision making in real time. Um, it was also we also saw the use, active use of surveillance, you know, um, systems in disease eradication. Now, when you bring that to malaria programs in most countries, the question is, um, do we have such data? Do we need to expand the data that we need for um, eradication? For instance, should we include genomic data in our surveillance systems? Um, what do the policymakers see beyond those who are driving malaria programs, what does the Minister of Finance want to see? What should the president or some high level political actor see? Um, with COVID, we saw very simple dashboards that were being used to engage not just the political leaders, but also engage the population. Might there be something for the malaria programs to learn in that regard? Um, finally, we also talked about the community engagement. A lot was said yesterday, but I think it's really, um, it can't be overemphasized. In Nigeria, the issue of legitimacy um, came up, and that's why programs like polio eradication required extensive community engagement. 
not just in a top-down manner such that as you're distributing badness to a community or trying to effect a behavior change in the community, but where the community was seen as part and parcel of the design and implementation and that agency was given to them. Is there again something the malaria programs can learn from that? I'll just leave and end with just five um, key reflections and takeaways from what we um, uh, researched. One again is the role of the champion and sponsor. Um, it seems to have been a theme uh, around all this. Um, the exception being COVID, where on one hand, we saw um, a lot of global solidarity, but on the other hand, we saw a rise in nationalism that you know, was not something that we would want to see in, in global health. There's a, um, a quote that is attributed to Winston Churchill that comment the hour, comment the person. Um, but it appears that in these cases, it's kind of like the reverse. It's really comment the person or global champion, then comment the hour or the impetus for eradication. So that's something worth considering. The second um, key takeaway was for countries to have the agency for adaptability. So national programs, as well as those who fund and support them must embrace you know, innovation, um, more flexibility and efficiency in execution. Countries should allow to test what works in their particular contexts and adapt accordingly. So like Ravi mentioned, financing is not just in the, um, the fiscal uh, envelope increasing, but also in the way the resources are deployed, do they enable countries to adapt these interventions to their context. Third is community partnerships. And I think we've talked on that in terms of just being very intentional um, with the way we engage with communities. On data and performance management, we need to rethink the type of data being collected, its frequency, and how it is being used to engage multiple stakeholders. And then lastly, there is the issue of a clear singular mandate. We know that whereas all the programs we looked at had very clear mandates that often appeared binary. It was eradicated or not eradicated. With malaria, it seems to be more nuanced and more complex where almost in parallel, we have those pursuing control, which makes sense in some contexts, elimination and eradication all simultaneously. Perhaps there's the lesson to be learned there that singularity of purpose may be one of the approaches we may, that may be helpful in our quest towards eradication of malaria. I'll stop and end here and um, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kaleti. You raised really important issues. Um, I'm, I'm, a lot of the issues you raised are going to be discussed again in the next panel when we talk about training and capacity building. And I'm really glad you mentioned about the need for different expertise. Um, and this really connects well with the the Feeding Malaria Genes to the Globe, the initiative that Professor Roselake, um, Dean Williams, and Diane Wirth, um try to build up here in the school. So um, we're going to have two discussants now. Um, the first one, um, Kafui Senya, um, responsible for providing technical support and guidance to the Ministry of Health in Ghana. He's a public health specialist with experience working in health administration and communicable diseases at subnational, national, and international levels. And Dr. Uh, Regina Rebnovich, uh, Gina is the Exxon Mobile Malaria Scholar in Residence at Harvard University and Director of the Malaria Elimination Initiative at IS Global at the University of Barcelona. So um, first, uh, let's hear from Kafui and then Gina, and uh, then we're going to have a discussion. Kafui, please. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to the presenters. Um, this is um, a really great um, discussion. Um, and the issues that have been raised are indeed really relevant. We do need to start rethinking um, our approach to um, eliminating um, these communicable diseases to be specific malaria. And the points that the papers make are really, really relevant. Um, take the financing issue, for example, it is um, absolutely factual that um, we are not going to have an increase in um, international 
funding to um, Africa and the lower middle income countries um, going forward. Um, but it's really interesting that the paper also brings out the issue that that does not really mean in reality that there's uh, less funding available. Um, we really need to, of course, do more with less. But at the same time, if we really look um, at other opportunities, including domestic uh, resource mobilization, we really can uh, begin to notice that we can actually have even more funding um, available. The paper brings out the point of how we actually underestimate um, the domestic resource inputs into, um, into malaria. So when we put all this together, we realize that though international do that funding, yes, the prospects are low of that increase and we really could have more. And that's where the governance issues come in. Um, we, if, if we are able to mobilize and have improved governance, and both at the political and then the technical level, we should be able to have this challenge that we find on ourselves, which is a major funding a problem for malaria and control uh, would, would be better addressed. And I just want to give a few examples as well we, of some of the things that we could uh, consider to be doing to improve the governance. Um, for in, in my work supporting the Ministry of Health, for example, we've been moving the idea of some of the diseases having an integrated strategy, national strategic plan, um, especially for HIV and tuberculosis, for example, we've been moving that idea. And um, those two programs are very closely related. The interesting thing is that when you go down to the health facility level, to the community level, these diseases are quite well integrated because most of the time, the same healthcare workers provide the services, except at the tertiary levels where they are specialists. Uh, by, well, as you move up the ladder, there's a lot of um, verticalization becomes very much, much more apparent. And so we, we've been trying to support the countries to get to the point where they will be able to maintain that independence and focus on their individual programs, but in areas of collaboration, they, they work together and improve efficiencies. One way that would, for example, show efficiency is when you come to the program review where you need to do field visits, the same field visits could be used to review the malaria, HIV, tuberculosis program. Maybe an additional day, right? And that would be save some significant One amount minute. of money. Yes. The last, maybe I'll just round up with, with um, emphasizing the point also that donors would also need to be more committed to the issue of integration, because sometimes it's the donor restrictions that have been stated that um, are a limit to, to the integration. So whilst the domestic efforts are all going, the donor community would also need to continue to be engaged to help improve the integration when it comes to governance. Thank you. Thanks, Kafui. Gina. Thank you. Um, uh, congratulations on a paper that attempts to really capture the lessons learned from very different diseases, and that's a good place to start. Um, we always talk about the complexity of malaria, and of course, every disease is complicated, but when we compare it to what we can learn from smallpox and polio and onco, we have to remember that those programs had basically single interventions in terms of a drug or a vaccine with uh, integration into health systems, vertical versus horizontal uh, programs, and um, good surveillance, of course. So the challenge with malaria is that we have a combination of tools. We have diagnosis, treatment, and now an growing list of prevention tools, including potentially a vaccine. And it's these combination strategies that challenge every element of governance. And I thought I would just give some examples. 
but it also points to the need for country ownership um, uh, towards elimination because the actual mix of interventions may be very context specific to the parasite, to the host dynamics, and to the health system and the very different ways that health systems are organized. So I, that, that's point number one. Point number two, uh, just reflecting on both talks, the challenge is the financing and it can get overwhelming and a little depressing in terms of how we do more with less, how we do more with the same. Um, so two comments on that is that we have to recognize and the lesson from polio is to value and to put it on the table, how much countries are putting in to the malaria effort. And it tends to be human resources rather than um, uh, commodities, which is what external funds are quite often used for, but it's, it's mission critical. You cannot deliver without people. You cannot deliver without leadership at the national level and with trained people to interpret data and create their own policies. So it's, it's very much linked. Point number three, um, which wasn't reflected, so I wanted to highlight um, because it's in the papers, is the governance of technology and innovation. And um, it is in contrast to a vaccine in malaria where we have no single magic bullet, at least not yet, uh, governance is really important in the research arena. And um, without getting into an argument of how we prioritize operational research and what kind of research is important, um, is I think we can all agree that we have some questions, particularly in the context of leadership and, and, and financial constraints. Uh, can we streamline the program? Are we doing it uh, as the paper asks? Are we targeting the right resources? Are we selecting the right interventions? And how to scale it and complement in the local context? And I would like to add to that, it's not just in individual interventions, but the actual combination strategy that uh, is optimized for the country. And there's a lot of work that has been done in sub-regional stratification. All of that means the work to translate from guidelines to operational efficiencies to maximize the use of resources requires good governance, good leadership, good training at the local level, particularly with uh, the comments that everyone's making on multi-sectoral and, and engagement. Um, the questions that have been raised about financing, is it enough? Can it be sustained? Is it effectively utilized? Um, is very challenging in the context of variety of funders and um, um, uh, the, their requirements. And um, uh, the only answer I have for that is that COVID will also have had an impact on national funding because it is a global pandemic. Um, but that recognizing the value of national funding will also avoid the top-down prioritization of, of polio. Uh, in which the priority was made at a global level uh, at meetings and one minute to down. The final comment has to do with this concept of a global champion. And I think it's something that bears thinking because we do need a variety of voices. And I would only ask us to reflect on the role of a global champion for advocacy the role of championship and leadership for implementation and how we balance that off with national prioritization and national locus of control. So I would like to also make the case for local champions. Uh, and I think that there's ample evidence that there are leaders in, in countries that they are able to make their voices heard and to supporting them is a critical component of what I think this paper reflects. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. So uh, before I let the speakers uh, reply, let me just add a few more things. So one is um, what you ended with, Gina, was one of my questions. So how we reconcile the, the need for a global champion in rather skepticism that we're going to be able to raise international funding. So uh, 
can we revisit this idea of the leaders and, and maybe we need a series of local leaders that together spearhead change from bottom up. Um, it's okay if we get a global leader, but it probably doesn't hurt. So I would love to hear uh, your ideas on this. And one question for Ravi, and then I'll let you speak is, what do you think it's the role of the private sector in supporting local funding as well? Is that also an untapped resource that we could think about? So let me start with Ravi. I'm going to give you uh, three minutes, and then we're going to move to Kalechi. Sure. Um, I mean, I think in, in terms of private finance, just, just to answer the question, I mean, it is already substantial. So in fact, in the slide I showed, which uh, we showed the numbers for Nigeria, 80% of their financing was already private from households. And so I think the question that really raises is, even though there is that huge spending going on on malaria, because you know 40% of all healthcare visits in that country are for malaria, the fact is then it's not been spent in a very effective manner. And why? The health system isn't doing its job because there are huge access barriers. And the biggest access barriers in many of these countries is simply the fact that people have to pay. And if you want poor marginalized people to go for malaria treatment and all sorts of other kinds of treatment, because they're not gonna differentiate, because they're essentially going to go for treatment for fevers in, in, most, in, in most cases, uh, you have to basically use public financing. So I think, you know, people I know in, in the finance community often get very excited about private financing, but unless the health system is supported by a basic underpinning of strong public financing, which means ultimately local taxation for most countries, particularly middle-income countries, it's the private financing is not going to make a difference. It's really, we have to get the basics right. And the basics of healthcare access is you need public financing. Okay. Um, in uh, Kalechi. Thank you very much for the excellent questions and, and comments. And um, I'll just reflect on the question mm -hmm. about the balance between having or emphasis on a global champion and versus the tension between that and, uh, and having national ownership and country leadership. Uh, just to say fundamentally, I, I don't think these are mutually um, exclusive. Um, so starting with the, the, the country ownership, I think that's, that's critical, right, at two levels. One, the political leadership. Malaria has to be a problem that they recognize um, its importance and its impact on the economy. And as Ravi mentioned, 40% of hospital visits, it's due to malaria. So that has significant impact on the economy. And someone needs to take that mantle. During the polio eradication days in Nigeria, the president actually had a presidential task force on polio that was chaired by um, Dr. Mohamed Pati, who had direct access to the president. So it was a presidential mandate. And the president made a political statement that he would not hand over polio cases to his successor. So that's one. Secondly, at the national level, and, I, and um, you almost look at the, where does the national malaria program manager sit? It sits in the, the departments that reports to somebody else, like in Nigeria, reports to the head of public health, who reports to the permanent secretary, who reports to the minister. So almost like four to five levels removed from the presidency. How is that person going to navigate to get that political buy-in and ownership? You almost need a super national program manager with skill sets that are not necessarily purely technical. And I'm sure that's to be covered in subsequent sessions. But the reason and the rationale I see for a global um, leader is because, okay, one country effectively, you know, managing and eliminating malaria doesn't mean that the next country will do so. So if there's a global mandate, there needs to be someone that actually coalesces and galvanizes support. And that could be just advocacy. It could be pressure on presidents and political leaders to align around a common vision and a common goal. We will not eradicate malaria globally, I mean, I would argue, if you leave it to the individual countries to decide or to hope that you have that national and political leadership, however necessary that is. And I think that's where that comes in. You know, what's, and it might be financing, it might be agenda setting, it might just be making sure that there is alignment globally around the target and the focus. And that's where I see, um, these complementing each other rather than being, you know, at odds against each other. 
Thank you, Kalechi. So um, Dr. Rose Lake challenged all of us to think of the game changing strategy. So I'm going to give you each one one minute. Um, and that includes this discussions to think um, what is your game changing strategy uh, to advance the issues we discuss here. So may I start with Ravi? Sure. I mean, I, I think the one thing that I've learned from thinking about this in the past, JS, is I think the importance of thinking about the overall health system, particularly in high burden countries. A country like Nigeria, the health system is a malaria system, in effect. It treats malaria and a few other things on the side. So if you want to address malaria, you have to change the health system. So I think the game strain strategy here is this cannot be divorced separately into a disease specific silo. We have to focus on basics. The countries have succeeded, fix the health systems first sometimes in response to malaria, but they fixed the health system. And I think that's the first thing, that the, kind of the game chain strategy that I would advise. And it has to be driven by local people, by local voters, by local populations. Thank you, Ravi. Kalachi. Okay, great. It's hard to find the magic bullet, right? Um, um, one would want to say innovation and technology. So a, a, a very highly effective malaria vaccine would go a long way until now we're dealing with COVID. So I'll say, recasting malaria, not just as a health problem, but as a economic developmental challenge would be a game changer in many countries. And because that would get the right people um, at the table and create the right level of urgency and um, political commitment that's needed. Okay, and that matches exactly what the president of Uganda asked us to do, how much I would save. So it is an, an economic problem as well. Um, Kafui. Yes, so I, I couldn't agree more with Ravi and, and Kelechi. Yeah. Um, and especially with Kelechi, I was just thinking we need to start looking at malaria not just as a health problem and not just as a health system, but a complete national problem. And that's what would enable us get the needed domestic resources to, to, to finance it. So that's what I would say. Just like COVID, we've, we've approached COVID. It's not been seen as more of a health, but as economic, as political, and um, that's what would make the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Kafui. Gina? I'd like to comment on something different, and that is a lot of the discussion led me to rethinking the governance structure around operational research. And how the funding that is available can be used optimally to answer questions that are important locally. And um, I, that's not necessarily development of a new vaccine, but how to, how to make the best of what we've got, not only the tool, but how it's used, how it's scaled, how we evaluate its impact and how countries make decisions about what to replace. That's my wish. Optimize for change, lovely. Thank you all for this discussion, for the hard work uh, that many of you put over the few months. I think we have a lot of food for thought and uh, we're gonna segue into the next panel that will connect with a lot of things we discussed here. So we're gonna talk about um, capacity building and training and the session will be uh, moderated by my co-chair in that working group, uh, Professor Friday Okonofua, um, he's from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the University of Benin, Nigeria. Friday, over to you, my friend.